today I'm going to focus a little bit on our we recently launched our 2010 Corporate Responsibility Report. So today I was going to walk you through, um, primarily focus on the report a little bit, but walk you through our materiality analysis and how we arrived at what we wanted to report on and also how we engage stakeholders in the process. Um, I would say that our case study is probably one that might be most interesting to folks that are thinking about starting stakeholder engagement or don't have an elaborate stakeholder engagement program in place, um, and that, you know, different ways that you might engage stakeholders on a, on a smaller level. So, am I supposed to? Yeah, you can use the... <laughs> and you might best know us for our flagship Norton antivirus product. So you've either had good or bad experiences, but you probably, that's what you know us for. That's what we're, um, our brand is most recognized for. And we have a, a philanthropy program as well that we're donating about $22 million a year in cash and, um, and software. Um, Just to kind of share with you some of recent awards and recognition we've received, um, and I, I would preface this with, um, we've, we've had our program, you know, for about probably the past four years, we've had a formal program. We don't execute on our program to win awards, um, but hearing from peer groups and industry groups and being recognized um, does validate the good work we do, and it helps us, especially internally, I think, demonstrate the value of the program. So um, just to share with you some of the organizations that, that have recognized some of the work that Semantic's done, some of the indexes, et cetera, that we sit on. So what was our approach to our corporate responsibility reporting effort in 2010? Um, for the first time, we did a web-based report. Um, we published, this is our second report. So our first report in 2008 was a PDF. And um, we, this time, had went through the process of integrating and creating a web-based only report. And so our CR website is our report for the company. Um, we also will have a, a printed executive summary that we use for customers, we use it for talent retention, we use it for different methods like that, um, and, and try to circulate it and integrate it into different things the company is doing. We use it at our conferences, et cetera. But, um, but the actual meat of what we do is, is located on our website. And if you go to the semantic.com site, you'll see it in the About Us section. Um, I also want to say that we didn't seek external assurance for the report. Um, some companies do that. We, quite honestly, um, we're not in a financial position where we could um, invest to that extent. Um, I also think at the stage of our program, I'd rather invest the resources in building the program than in the external insurance component. But what we did do, and what we did for the second time, is we assembled a cross group of um, advisors. So we used an external advisory panel to work with us through the reporting process. Um, they focused in certain areas. So we had, for example, a nonprofit that focused on environment. We had a nonprofit that focused on um, cybersecurity. We had um, industry groups, so different groups represented, and we worked on with them to advise us through the process, but also to then um, provide us with a commentary <coughs> to the report, which is published on our website. And it's something that we agreed not to edit, or and we also always reserved the right not to publish it if it was that terrible, but it was actually, I would say, pretty good. And, but it also did have recommendations for improvement. And it was probably, I would say, the first piece of feedback we got on the report. And so that's publicly available for folks to see. So I'll talk a little bit 
about the materiality analysis that we went through. And before I do that, I would say that our report was also done um, consistent with the GR, GRI guidelines, and we used them in developing our report. Um, we gave ourselves a B rating, and we're currently in the process of getting that um, reviewed by the GRI. We also um, are members of the UN Global Compact, so we use this report as a way to meet our requirements for the communication on progress, which the UN Global Compact requires as well. So there's cross referencing throughout the report to the UN Global Compact principles as well. Um, so the materiality analysis. So we undertook a materiality analysis so that we as a company could identify and prioritize what the report should be about. So it's not just Cicely sitting in a room saying, you know, these are the programs I really like and I want to tell the world about. It's more about what does the company think is important and what do our stakeholders also think is um, so what does material mean? Material means the issues that are of high concern to our stakeholders and of high strategic relevance to semantic. And therefore, they're the core of our communications and what we want to report. The methodology that we used. So basically, to conduct the analysis, we compiled like a comprehensive list of, both, of, of economic, environmental, social, and governance issues that we thought would be material. So we started off with our own list of what we thought people should think about. Um, and we obviously use things like the GRI to help influence and guide that list. And then we began with the issues that we had identified in our previous report in 2008. And we sort of mapped that out. And then we incorporated comments and feedback that we had gotten from that report. So that report had a survey tied to it and we got some initial feedback from um, readers, and so we integrated that into the analysis. And some of the things that the stakeholders had said at that time is that they wanted Symantec to more directly address our carbon footprint, international activities. They said we were very US-centric. They wanted it to be more global. They wanted us to look at our supply chain and have be more accountable for what we did, and also be more transparent on our diversity performance. So these are, these are some of the, the, some of the feedback that we got. Next, we reviewed a range of documents um, reflecting aggregate stakeholder interests and concerns, and we kind of scored each issue. And so, for example, we considered questions posed in the sustainability ratings and rankings questionnaires that we get. So many of us all get the Dow Jones sustainability profile, you know, update, please update this questionnaire, or from other analysts. And so we used that as, to help influence this analysis. Um, so again, you know, as I said before, when you're thinking about doing a stakeholder engagement, in a lot of ways we're doing it already when we respond to these questionnaires or when we participate in these surveys because we're gathering and seeing the kinds of things that our stakeholders think are relevant. Um, we also looked at responses to customer employee satisfaction surveys, so what kinds of feedback we were getting from those, um, those places, media coverage, peer reports, um, industry and trade association documents, you know, if there were write-ups about the company. We tried to gather as much of that information as possible. Um, and then we evaluated each issue from the perspective of its potential impact on the company, taking into account possible effects on sales, brand and reputation, employee risk management, cost savings, and ability to deliver products and services. And then when we compiled our, we plotted all this on a matrix, which I'll share with you in a minute. And when we compile that, we also went to get external stakeholder input by using our advisory council. And so we got to have them give us feedback on the results and their initial feedback and a review of what they saw and what we were finding. And then we finalized the ranking of the issues based on their input and the recommendations from a semantic cross-functional team. So we had a cross-functional team um, that worked on the report of semantic. It was global. It represented employees at all levels of the organization, and um, we utilize that team in the process as well. So I would say that the materiality analysis, as we compiled our report, if I had to divide it into pieces of what we spent time on, it probably represented almost <coughs> a third of the effort that went into preparing the report. It was a huge part of our, of our effort. So I don't know how clear this is, um, but this is, sort of what the end result looked like. And again, this is on our website, and you can see it more clearly. But this is how we um, ranked 
this is what our materiality matrix looks like and how we rank the issues. And the top right hand quadrant shows both stakeholders um, and what the company found to be most relevant. And then you can see certain things that, that drop off the list. Now, that doesn't mean that we still didn't choose to report on certain things that might have dropped off the list. And a good example of that would be something like employee engagement. I couldn't imagine publishing a corporate responsibility report without talking about how we engage our employees or volunteerism. But that didn't necessarily fall in the quadrant of what the stakeholders and the company perceived um, that was the most material to the business and to the company from a CR perspective. So the issues that we ranked as highest priority to the company um, included securing information and helping individuals stay safe online. And within that issue, we also talked about privacy. Um, the second material issue that we identified was increasing customer loyalty by raising customer satisfaction levels. We also addressed climate change and thought it was very important to identify ways to show how we were reducing our energy use and our greenhouse gas emissions, not only in our own sites, but the products that we were developing or marketing that could help our customers do so. Um, upholding human rights um, was a material issue, including privacy and freedom of expression. Um, promoting diversity and inclusion, and um, that's a very broad issue, but a big focus for us is definitely on gender, um, a huge issue in the software industry around <coughs> women in technology and at our own company where the percentage of women is about 27% and the percentage of, of women in leadership is even smaller and the percentage of women in engineering is about 15%. So huge issue for the industry and for our company also. And then finally retaining top talent. Um, again, competitive advantage. You know, right now the economy is down, but what happens as things improve? How do we as a company stay competitive and retain top talent? Area. So those are the issues that we identified. And just going back to the materiality matrix, I just kind of want to talk a little bit more about how we engage, you know, ongoing stakeholder um, engagement. So the results of this materiality analysis represent the aggregate perspective of stakeholders. So this would include the shareholders that we that we reach through our social responsible work. Um, socially responsible investors, right? It would include customers that come to us and request social responsibility being part of their RFPs or um, part of their supplier scorecards, et cetera. It would include enterprise clients, employees, community members, nonprofit organizations, regulators, channel partners, people in academia, and just general thought leaders. So, and we, we understood that this materiality analysis paints the overall landscape, we also realize that each stakeholder group has their own unique perspective to add. So what we did was we kind of engaged with stakeholder groups, and this is sort of an ongoing basis now. We, they've helped us identify this, but going forward, how do we continue to engage? Um, and we continue to do that to develop a deeper understanding of how we address their needs while furthering our own mission of enabling confidence in a connected world. So how do we continue to do that? So we continue to survey customers and understand how they use our products, what challenge they face from security threats. Um, we use focus groups, formal performance reviews, and customer feedback. And what I'm happy to say is that within a lot of these methods that the company uses historically, corporate responsibility is, is, is creeping in. It's now part of these discussions that we're starting to have. Um, we have always asked employees to rate our performance in doing surveys, but ethics, corporate responsibility, broadly, environmental initiatives, diversity, are all now a big component of those types of surveys. And so we're gathering that data on an ongoing basis. We reach out to our communities and we talk to teachers and parents about how to safe online, that's stay safe online. That's a signature program for, our, for us and it's a way that we can use what we do to better our society and to, to make a difference. So we're always engaging those groups of stakeholders. And we also engage in activities and coalitions to promote changes in public policy. So it's really, even though I worked 
for many years in a department that was made up of government relations and corporate responsibility. It was almost like we operated in two different worlds. The public policy people had their initiatives focused on cybersecurity or privacy, um, very much from a legislative perspective. And corporate responsibility had our initiatives. And so it took a lot of work to kind of bring us together. We started to look at public policy as one thing for the entire company and that also integrated corporate responsibility. And I think that's a huge opportunity for stakeholder engagement. Um, you know, one of the few other groups in the company that's really always looking externally and getting external feedback from a stakeholder is your government affairs team. So for those of you that work separately from that team, I think it's an opportunity to have ongoing stakeholder engagement and improve your programs. And again, finally, we participate in various industry focus groups to discuss specific corporate responsibility challenges, develop solutions, and identify new opportunities to create sustainable products and services. So even though I've identified for you the things that I think were, you know, that came up in our materiality analysis as the most important, there are certain things that are always relevant um, as a company. There are certain things that our stakeholders, I think, would expect us to talk about. And so they're always a part of our, um, our reporting process. And they would include environment, would be one example. Um, our environmental program is broken. It's a platform broken into four main areas. One is around IT data center. So for a software company, you know, when I first started doing this work, we, we, we struggled with, well, you know, this was maybe six years ago that we were kind of evaluating this, but it's like, well, what impact does a software company really have on the environment, right? We don't have huge smokestacks, we don't have huge manufacturing, we just have a little piece of software that we're sticking in a box. Well, I think, you know, flash forward to today, I think we all realize that every company has an impact, but software companies definitely do too. And so um, one of the main areas in our energy um, issues definitely around our IT use and it's around our data centers. And so we're very focused on efficiency in the data center, both from an internal operations perspective, but also from a go-to-market strategy and how we can develop products that help our customers maximize energy efficiency in the data center. Um, Semantic has a whole business line devoted to storage management uh, on the enterprise side. Um, conservation, which I would focus, would say focuses more on our operations, how we green our buildings, how we manage recycling efforts, paper usage, um, you know, we, have, we utilize lead, we um, set targets for reduction, we have green teams um, locally across the company that are involved. So how do we do all of those things to conserve and make the company more environmentally responsible? Software delivery. So when we did look, we found that our software um, boxes really were too big. And so we have actually uh, minimized our, our packaging. We've also gone, done more to ship online. So our transportation related to software packaging um, has been impacted, as has just overall our, our um, online sales. We're not delivering as much. And we're requiring that all of our suppliers are ISO 14,000 compliant when they do business with us. And finally, the area of transportation is the fourth piece of the platform, which is around employee commuting, um, teleconferencing, and also business travel. And I can't, you know, we reduce business travel significantly um, for the company, but I can't take, I think, all the credit for that, and neither can the CR program. I think a lot of that has to do with the economy. Um, you know, people's budgets being kind of sliced, and they're not allowed to travel as much. So I think the real test would be when the economy improves and people's budgets are reinstated, and they can travel, well, they ought not to. And what are other programs that in the meantime we're putting in place to help curb it? So environment is definitely something beyond climate change that we discuss in our report. And there's a lengthy section on um, our approach to environment, some of the challenges that we face and some of the things that we're doing. Um, community outreach is also a big focus area. So as I mentioned, I couldn't imagine publishing a corporate responsibility report without having a section on Community, um, community relations. So we focus on um, our um, philanthropy as well as our employee engagement. And we're pretty transparent as to what we give, how we give it, who we give it to, what our methodology is, um, and how we have a, you know, and what our challenges are, quite honestly, in the area of philanthropy and community relations. Um, and the final area that we focus on 
And an area that I neglected to mention that I also have um, purview of in the company is our governance and ethics. So I oversee our ethics and compliance program at Symantec. We have an office of ethics and compliance and um, very focused on, you know, our, we really see this as a brand, attributable to our brand. I mean, every company should care about ethics and how they operate. But since we really see that we're selling trust in the products that we, that we deliver, we think, you know, the, the ethical component of what we do is even more relevant and important to the company. So it's, um, it's an important part of everything Symantec does, and it's very much a part of our corporate responsibility program and messaging and the challenges and opportunities that we think we have as a company in this area. The other area that we explore deeply in that section is, around, is on public policy. And we are, again, very transparent about what we do, what we focus on, and, um, and how we meet our public policy program objectives as a company. And then finally, um, we have a section on performance highlights and goals, where we lay out how we felt we did with the goals that we set forth in the fiscal year 08 CR report. We talked about what our new goals are going forward from fiscal, we're in our fiscal year 11 right now, so going forward over the next few years. And um, semantic reports every other year. We do not do a, a full CR report every year, but on the off years, we provide an update as to how we're doing against our goals. So that'll be something that we publish that, that'll be made available to folks. So, I think the final thing I kind of wanted to share with you are some of the challenges that we see and that, that have come out of the process. Um, I was talking on the break about, you know, this year, we, since we opted to do the, the report as a web-based <coughs> report, we kind of gave up a little bit of the control that we had the first time. The first time, and that's not up here, this is just a challenge I'll share with you that proved to be, I think, a great experience. That, you know, when you do a PDF, you really own the report. You work, either you write it or you work with consultants that help you prepare the report, and it, it, it's, the data is represented the way that you want and your vision comes out through the report, taking into account, you know, all the stakeholders that are, that are participating. When we decided to do a web-based report, well, I, I, you know, I can't, I'm a woman of many talents, but I cannot create a website. And um, we have wonderful, you know, obviously internal resources that, that do that for a living. And so we engaged our internal web team to help us do a report online. Well, what I, the learning that I had is that, you know, when you, the more people you involve in a process like that, the more of other people's thoughts and the way things should look and what their perceptions are around a specific area are, come into it. And so um, it, was, it was a huge learning, not only for our team, but also for the web team which crosses a large part of our marketing department. And um, so I think the end result is we have a report that is re very reflective of not only what our corporate responsibility sort of professionals believe, so stakeholders that do this for a living every day, and this is the world they're in, but also from a much more, I think, cross-sectional group in the company that's focused on Branding, communications, how do you get your message out? Um, how do you deliver this kind of story? How does semantic want to be seen? Um, so, you know, kind of just flipping back, I would not have initially, I was telling Jeff this on the break, probably gone for a report that had it on its cover flowers. But um, you'll see if you look at our report that it's actually full of vibrant illustrations, artwork. And, and what it ended up representing is a really nice place that you want your readers to go and visit, full of great content. So I think the lesson that I learned is, you know, even though I spent a lot of time trying to demonstrate to people that, you know, CR is a, is a very important topic, it's intellectual, it's business focused, it needs to be taken seriously, it's not fluffy, it's not soft. I think at the same time, the lesson I learned is, bottom line is you want people to read what you put out there. I mean, we work really hard when we put together our CR reports, and we collect a lot of data. And so I think the, the final piece is like, how do you really turn that data into something that you can get most people to come visit it and see it and understand it and grasp? Because you have a broad group of stakeholders. Not everybody's an analyst. Not everybody's coming to your report because they're evaluating the company or they have enormous experience in the area. You know, a lot of times you have employees that are hitting your site because they're thinking about, well, maybe I might want to go work there. 
And so they might have a completely different background and, and reason. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. And I didn't have it on the page, but it was definitely a challenge that ended up being, I think, very successful in the end. Um, you know, other challenges I think that we face as a company include, one of them is definitely around our greenhouse gas reduction um, for the company. So a few years ago, we set a goal for reduction. And um, we're making pretty good progress. And we still are on the operations side. But where we're challenged is on the side that has to do with um, our data centers. And um, our business model, as many companies, has really shifted to software as a service to a cloud computing model. And when you're offering you know, cloud computing, you're basically saying to your customers, you know, you're going to lease our product. And we're going to provide you everything for you. And, and your, those issues really, and, you know, this is a sort of byproduct of it, those issues that have to do with energy efficiency and et cetera, they really transfer from you to us. And so as a large SaaS provider, we, we now have to figure out how do, you, how, do you, how do you project out what your energy use is going to be, how do you, and how do you set targets for reduction when you're cloud offerings are constantly growing and changing. So that's a, that's a huge challenge for us as a company. And the way we dealt with it in the report is we tried to demonstrate the progress we were making on the building side, so operations, and some of the challenge, the, the progress we were not making on the data center side to show, to show some of the, the differences there. Um, so I think, as I mentioned before, um, even though we've identified gender as an issue, even though we know that it's important for our industry, we know that it's important to have more women at the table. I mean, innovation is what we're all about. So the more creative minds you have at the table, the more different ways that people think, the more innovative you are as a company, that we, um, that we continue to fall short of that target. And so in this report, we've actually put clear targets that we plan to meet. Um, in the man, in the like growing management of women, for example. Um, also, we have issues expanding globally, and so um, we're working on um, enhancing our code of conduct training, um, putting processes in place so that we can manage our ethics program more globally. And finally, um, even though I've kind of tried to share with you the way that we deal with stakeholder engagement, I think there's a huge opportunity for us to really grow our stakeholder engagement program and take it to the next level. And that um, continues to be a challenge, but an opportunity at the same time. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. I see a question here. Thank you. I'm curious to know how you selected or found your external stakeholder panel, how it was managed, if you had any issues with people being willing to participate, those kind of issues. People being unwilling to participate? Well, I mean, I've heard that so many nonprofit organizations get approached by companies that they want to be on the stakeholder advisory panel. It means people, some people don't have time or mm -hmm. interest. Yeah. Um, no, I wouldn't say that we didn't have um, people who were unwilling to participate. Um, and we did have people who, before they joined, thought it through carefully, went back to their organizations to make sure they could devote the time. And when they committed, they, they felt they were able to do it. I don't recall anyone who didn't participate that we had asked. Um, so that wasn't, wasn't an issue. Um, I think during the process, we might have had people come in and out of the process a bit. So somebody might have gotten really involved in something else they were doing and couldn't participate on a phone call. Um, but we, we tried to keep communication going with email updates and keeping everybody sort of in the loop as to what was going on so they could continue to re-engage. You know, for example, you know, these are all grown-ups. When we got to the letter writing piece, um, I thought we might have to shepherd along a little bit and kind of, you know, encourage that process. Um, and, you know, they just kind of took it over and, and did it themselves and were very, you know, functioned really well. So I, I think overall it was a really committed group. Um, we found a variety of people. I mean, in the, in the, the space that has to do with um, cybersecurity, we know who those partners are. But um, we tried to pick a variety of folks that we weren't really connected with who could give us objective, objective feedback. You so we didn't find that directly. to be a problem. Hmm? You just approach them directly, say, uh -huh. would you be on our panel? Yeah. yeah. A question about your materiality analysis. I'm wondering how much definitional material that you gave the stakeholders in terms of defining those issues. Because one of the results um, 
uh, surprised me a little bit. Um, human rights was on your list, and you know, sort of my conventional understanding of human rights, I don't see the connection to a, a, a security software business. Right. So the issue, and we did, if you look on our website, following the materiality analysis is, a, is an index of, well, this is basic, but it's an index of defined terms. So at least we're all speaking the same language. Um, so that was very necessary, and someone on our team had recommended that we do that, and we found it very helpful. Human rights is relevant from a privacy and freedom of expression perspective. So that's how, that's how it's important to our business. Um, semantic um, self-privacy, you know, I mean, we're, we're constantly, as a company, we, we have other people's information, and we also provide products that allow people to manage that sort of thing. So it's very important mm -hmm. for our business to, to develop policies around privacy, to help be part of the thought leadership around privacy, and to, um, and, and we have a lot of growth in that area, by the way. We say that we're a thought leader, but we have a huge opportunity there. Okay, I think we need to move, so thank you very thank much. You.